The difference between living for the will of God or living according to the flesh with the appetites of this world driving us. Okay, we'll talk about more what that looks like. Okay, could anyone give me an example of someone that's carnal? They're Christians, but they're still babies in their faith. Actually, Paul writes to 1 Corinthians, and this was a crowd that was very, very young in their faith and still very much um, worldly with their mindset. And so Paul wrote 1 and 2 Corinthians in their books of correction because they were definitely Christians, but they were living as if they weren't. So, um, when you think of a Christian, or anyone, or let's just say a Christian, that has a worldly mindset or lives according to the principles of this world, what example comes to your mind, for example? Do you mean a person? I'm yeah, talking about a Christian. Things that they do. Behaviors Behavior. of a believer. Like, I was thinking you wanted us to give you a name. <laughs> now, see, for me to ask for a name, that would be carnal. And for you to give it would even be more carnal. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. in this life if you want to consider it that and uh, um, he's well known in his church and people look up to him um, yet um, and he raises his hands and he worships yet he's abusive to his wife at home so that would be someone that possibly is a Christian but is very carnal He's driven by his anger and his needs. Carnal. There's a modern day term for that these days. Do you know what it is? Narciss narcissism. Narciss narcissism. Yeah. I'm kind of burned out on it. Because everybody I meet, every couple that comes in for counseling, one of them's a narcissist. You know? So a little burnt out on it. But it is legitimate. What does narcissism mean? Well, first of all, narcissists was a person and uh, he I think he was of royalty and he used to look at his face in the clear water of a river and admire his own beauty self-inflation self um, arrogant selfish self-admiration selfish self-admiration I guess if you need to know some traits Lucifer would have been the ultimate narcissist. He, yeah, because he was so beautiful, you know. Was the, the, um, um, they don't have issues. It's everyone else. So they're very quick to blame. They take very little ownership of what they've done wrong. And it's everyone else. And there's a lot of them around. And one of the other things is that they probably need intervention... And, and some kind of godly counseling the rest of their life. The, the one person as a pastoral counselor that I can't help is someone that doesn't have a problem. Mm -hmm. Narcissists don't have a problem. And they don't have one. And they don't have any, no. So they're, they're self-inflated, okay? So I would say someone in full-blown carnality is all about what they want, their needs, uh, their flesh, their will, and uh, that's pretty much it. Yes, you raised your hand. Um, I've been told they're extreme takers. You know, and they're very, very, 
takers. They never really, and, and they never get out, get over it usually. It's yes. very, very rare that they yes. change their ways. And, yeah. Right. Like, I guess it's possible. Like, if you were to, like, loan money to a narcissist as opposed to trying to borrow money from a narcissist. Probably, yeah. Yeah. Something like that. Uh -huh. Um, the other the other trait that I've learned is um, if people finally say I'm not living this way anymore with you, this is an abusive. And when I say that, I'm talking emotional. They're not usually violent people, but emotionally abusive. So uh, name calling, labeling, selfish, this kind of stuff. Um, Would they ever admit they were wrong? No. Well, well, let me back up. If they did, it would be very momentary and it would be attached to, but I wouldn't have done that if you didn't do that first. So their ownership of what they did wrong is tethered by the other person. But to take full ownership that it was completely my fault, I own everything, and to stay there, not that much. Matter of fact, another uh, word picture that I have in terms of people like this that don't take ownership is the stair step of manipulation. So let's say uh, here's a wife and uh, she just doesn't want to do this anymore. It's an abusive way to live. She's, she's always wrong. Uh, he's always right. Um, there's, there's screaming, there's alcoholism, there's a lot of stuff. Okay. And so she finally says, I'm done. Unless you get some deep help, uh, get on some medication, do whatever you got to do, I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. And so a classic narcissist would have these stair steps of emotions. At first he would be furious. Then he would be very sorrowful about what he's done wrong. And he would over apologize. Uh, some terms also that they do if they see that the person has stepped away is they drop what they call love bombs. So I really love you. I know God wants us to work this out. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, and, and I'm very, very committed. And of course, this is after they've said that for years. And then they become what we would call Mr. Repentant. So uh, they ask for forgiveness. And within either minutes or within 24 hours, they're accusing them of causing all of the problems in their life again. It's a yo-yo. So that's just an example. Anyhow, that would just be one sampling of someone dominated by the flesh or their spiritual, I mean not their spiritual, their fleshly appetites. That can also name the name of Christ. So anyhow, so James leaves us off. Well, let me, let me just say this. James in chapter 3, we had a nice discussion about the fire of the tongue in James chapter 3. And talked about the dangers, the wickedness, and the destructive expressions of a tongue. The tongue. And then talked about what a godly tongue looks like. And then we talked about the difference last week of godly wisdom and earthly devilish wisdom. And now James pulls those together in chapter 4 and talks more about um, earthly, putrid, toxic wisdom and the misuse of the tongue, as well as godly. So he begins with a question, and I might ask you the same question. He says, chapter 4, verse 1, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? So I want you to help me with this. What, generally speaking, in your opinion, you can speak for yourself or others or what you've seen or what you learn about, what, and I'm talking among Christians now, 
What causes quarreling, incessant quarreling, fighting, and resentment? What kind of situations among believers? Because he's talking to believers. What would be some common scenarios? Envy, impatience, envy. Well, envy is one, impatience with one another. Criticism of each other. Criticism of each other. Yes. <laughs> What did you say? Living in the past. Okay, bringing up the past, living in the past, won't let go of the past. Someone else? Opinionated. Being overly opinionated. Being intolerant of each other. Intolerant of each other, coming from a couple that's been married how long? 52 years. 52 years. More not intolerant of each other. They just don't know each other. <laughs> you don't know each other yet. By the way, I had an elderly couple in one of the churches I was a pastor of, and they were the happiest couple. You know, they're one of those proverbial couples that are in their 80s and they hold hands. You know, and they walk around and that you can see, they can just talk, they look into each other's eyes at the restaurant. And uh, um, they told me one time, we learned a long time ago that we'd rather as a married couple be happy than right. <laughs> So one of the things that causes quarrels is for the person that is highly opinionated that's never wrong. And has to be right. Now there's a certain, certain personality and temperament that does lean towards that area. I was doing a training one time. You know I have a side company, I told you that. I do workshops in local government, healthcare, a lot of places actually. Churches, schools. And I was, this was a, a healthcare community uh, that I was working with in Bakersfield, California. And I was talking about the personality differences. And uh, when I got to this particular personality type, which we could call a type A personality, I do colors, so it's, I call it a red type A. I said, um, a real healthy type A is very opinionated. And in many cases, sometimes they're rarely wrong because they're very, very smart. The only problem is they're so arrogant about it that people don't care if they're right. You know those people? They might be right, but we don't care. You got such a mouth and arrogant, we don't care if you're right. Matter of fact, you're wrong, not right, because of your arrogance. So anyhow, then I said, but the healthy type A's are open to the possibility, as remote as it may be, that they are wrong and you are right. The only thing I said is that you've got, to, you've got to show them this in a very calm, logical way. And a healthy, opinionated person will admit that you're right and they're wrong. And I said that and there was a young man in the back of the room going... <laughs> so I stopped everything. He's about 35. I said, Sir, do you find fault with what I'm saying. He says, oh yeah. <laughs> you think, he said this in front of all these doctors and nurses, he said, I've already got a law degree, I'm going to be a doctor now. And he said, you think you can prove me wrong. I am never wrong. <laughs> I said, really? You're not ever wrong? New? I said, well, let me ask you a question. Are you married? And he says, no, and my mother says I never will be. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. I proved my point, sir. <laughs> Sidebar, you don't get to stay married if you're never wrong. You don't get to stay married if you're never wrong. Okay, uh, different subject. All right. Anyone else? Something that would cheat in business would be a fleshly thing. Cheat in business? Yeah. Someone, so now here's, now I'm going to go to medical and state. Well, finish, finish what you're saying. Well, just something that to me that would, somebody that would cheat in business and then come to church on Sunday and be all holy, um, you know, it's just, this is wrong. There's an old saying if you, you've never been cheated really bad until a Christian's cheated you. Oh. Yeah. 
Okay, now we're going to get a little nitpicky here. So how about being paid under the table and not reporting your income? How about um, not reporting all of your income, whether you've been paid under the table or not? I mean, we can go real deep, you know, with deep, deep with this. Okay. That would be fleshly. Be lack of trust in the Lord. Lack of trust that the Lord's the one that can provide for us. So we got to kind of hoard our own stuff. You know. Anyhow, we can go on and on and on, and, and I don't want to continue to do that. Paul is talking to believers who are having among themselves. Now, these are Christians. They're not really within James's reach. These are Christians, Jewish people that have come to Christ that have, are scattered all over the world either due to um, being uh, born in Christian families that were in an exile or that believed in God in an exile, which is Babylon and Assyria, or they could have uh, left Jerusalem because of a lot of suffering and harassment and are in troubled areas now. Either way, this is a group of people that he's writing to that are having immense problems with one another. I mean, thus far, he's talked to them about the purpose of trials because they were um, blaming God for their trials. He talked to them about the purpose of temptation because they were blaming God for their temptations. He talked to them about the value of speaking correctly as a believer rather than having a foul mouth. And he goes all through this book correcting them on their behavior because they got sloppy. Let's just say that they were sincere believers and they got really sloppy in carnal. Okay? But he is talking to believers. And so he says, what causes quarrels and fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? And then he kind of describes it. Look what he says next. Verse 2. You desire and do not have. So that would be envy. They're envious of people that have, and maybe they're the have-nots. So it's a battle against the have-nots and the haves. And they don't applaud people who um, maybe have wealth or maybe got uh, a promotion at work. Instead, they envy them and resent them. I've always had a hard time with people who don't, don't applaud other people's successes. Instead, they think, why doesn't that ever happen to me? Very carnal, very passionate, very worldly. And so he says, one of the reasons that you're fighting with one another is because you desire what each other has and you do not have it yourself. Now, this is a real personal example, and I won't get too much detail, but... In the 60s and 70s, the government um, allowed clergy, pastors, ministers of churches all over the United States to have certain tax exemptions okay, that people that are not clergy have. And I've seen many, many, many times that, do you know about that, Steve? You know about that. Well, you, you came in later in the ministry. So in other words, in the 60s and 70s, clergy had the option to opt out of Social Security. That's still. And it's still that way. Yes. Well, once you opt out, you can't opt back in. So when I, it was, see, I was, it was probably 1977 or so, we had a CPA that was one of our honored staff as a pastor, and he said, now Bill, as a new pastor, as a young pastor, and he said, you can either opt out of Social Security or, or stay in it, and I go, like, I don't even know what you're talking about, I was 25 or less, and I said, what do you recommend? He goes, I recommend that you opt out. So I did, and once you opt out, you can't get back in. So, 
I've seen people in the past when they find that out, whether it's about me or someone else, get fit. you can just see it in their eyes. Like, they're not happy for me because they don't have what I have. See what I mean? They don't have to pay the tax. I mean, I got an exemption. So that's, that's it. Are, you're not upset at me too, are you? You're, you're not upset at me, are, are you? <laughs> you're just going, whoa, what's that? Well, then you have to provide for your retirement in another way, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, in order to be, in, this is a different subject. In order to have uh, be in Social Security, you have to have 10 quarters of work, which I had, thank God, before that time. So, so I still will get Social Security, but it's going to be minuscule because I was out of it for many, many years. My point is, it's not something, it's what other people have been upset about because they don't have it. That's an example, okay? So, yeah? yeah. Maybe I'm wrong. I okay. I'm quite sure I am. But what I see this more of a battle within yourself. It is. About you want, you want, you yeah. want, yeah. but you can't get, and so, that, yeah, that is. It's a battle within, he says. It's among your passions. But if someone gets angry about something you have that they don't have, that is a battle within. And it has to do with they do, with what they don't have, and it's about their uh, the darker side of the passions, actually. Well, and the next verse says about it, too. Yeah, he breaks it down even more. He says, is not this that your passions are at war within you? So you're right, Sue. It's an inward battle of the flesh that we have because we can't get what we want that someone else has. I was talking to a mom one time, and her daughter was kind of spoiled a little bit. Her daughter was nine, and they were shopping, and her daughter uh, said, Mommy, I want to go, I want, I want to buy that blouse. And her mommy said, No, honey. I'm not going to buy that blouse. We were here to shop for something else. And the nine-year-old girl says, if you don't give me that blouse, I'm going to scream with all of my voice. Do you know there are adults that think that way? Narcissists? Carnal people. I want my way. It'll only be my way. My way or the Highway. You know that phrase? Yeah. I do that all. <laughs> By the way, Frank Sinatra wrote the song My Way, and he ended up admitting it was, it, he regretted the day that he ever sang that song, and, and he hated singing that song. And I don't know why, but he just detested that song. It was written for him. My Way or Highway. Okay, let's continue on. So it's someone that's self consumed. It's about their world. Then he says, so you desire, do not have, so you murder, and, and that's not physical murder. There's more of a sense is that you're, you're killing the people that you can't stand with your words. They're murderous words. Shaming, blaming, Labeling, name calling, right on down to this. Then he goes to the next level of this carnality. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. So you want what someone else has as well, even if it's not appropriate. Covetousness, Old Testament, wanting someone else's husband or wife, covetousness, wishing you had that person. Then he says something very interesting. You do not have because you do not ask. Well, that's a legitimate. Jesus said that about prayer. He said, you do not have because you do not ask. So James is kind of working him a little bit. And he goes, you're probably thinking the only reason I don't have is because I don't ask. But then he puts his finger right on their nerve and he says, because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passions. 
Now that's interesting because when I was a younger believer, I was always intrigued with the, the verse that you see it in Proverbs and Psalms, where it says, God will grant you the desires of your heart. And I've often wondered, well, that's not what always happened for me, that God's granted me the desires of my own heart. But we're getting the answer right here. If what you're asking for is with wrong motives, you're never going to get that from the Lord. He won't give to people that ask with wrong motives, such as the well-meaning, loving, lottery player that says, if, Lord, if you let me just win the lottery, I'll give all my money to the Lord. Well, maybe there is that such a person, but, you know, usually lottery is about, hey, jackpot, baby. And I, I'm not prudish. I'm not down on that. I'm talking about motivations now. I'm not talking about lottery per se. I'm talking about the motivations of why we ask God to give us things. What's our motivation behind it? To honor the Lord, to please the Lord, to give to someone else? To live with what He gives us for His honor and glory. Okay. Anyhow, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passions. And then he talks about, like, what makes believers do this? It's not just a fleshly, carnal issue where it's about what we have. I've always loved what Chuck Swindoll says. You will never see a hearse after a funeral pulling a U-Haul trailer. <laughs> Can't take it with you, folks. It's all going to burn. And I might have said this before. Buy a new trailer. Buy a new car. Build a new house. Buy a brand new suit. And God has angels in heaven that put dents in cars. New cars. Just to see if we idolize the things that God has blessed us with. My wife Jenny, um, many, many years ago, was, was married to another man, and he's serving the Lord today. It's a real cool thing to see, but back then he wasn't. And uh, he had his own business, and uh, he, didn't, he didn't pay his taxes for five years, but she didn't know that because he managed his company, and she was a nurse and she had no idea until 10 o'clock one night the IRS 10 o'clock at night came knocking on her door five years of taxes not paid they owned a home a farmhouse on an acre it was beautiful IRS took her home took her property crushed her crushed her and she bowed before the Lord Lord I'll never get that attached to a home again see what I mean so look what he calls those who are fighting and quarreling over things they don't have that they want envy selfishness you adulteress people. Now what does that mean? What does that mean? What's he saying? What is he saying? Yeah? People that love something else other than God. Okay. That's basically spiritual adultery. Okay, spiritual adultery. The Bible talks a lot about adultery in the Old Testament uh, because Jesus brought his people out of the promised land and they they joined themselves with pagans. He called them adulterers because he's their husband and he carried his people out as a bride through the wilderness and redeemed her and loved her 
And it wasn't very long that they made a golden calf that they worshipped instead of the Lord. Okay? So an adulterer is someone that is not loyal to their spouse. They're cheating on their spouse. So James is saying, you are so much in love with what this world can offer you that you're having an affair with the world. The Lord is not your husband. You have walked away from your husband to marry up with the idolatry that the world offers. That's what he's saying. Now, this is an interesting though. I do a lot of counseling. I've helped a ton of people through affairs and the fallout of them. Usually, when someone drifts into an affair out of marriage, a couple things are going on. First of all, the one that drifts away is not content in their marriage. Usually contented spouses don't do this. So they're not content in their marriage. And it's not like they uh, purposely try to start an extramarital affair. They just meet someone at work that knows how to emotionally connect with them. And they have a common interest. And before you know it, their discontentment with their marriage, they found a true friend, they have an emotional affair and eventually a sexual affair. So when I think of those terms, I see it all the time. James is saying, you're to be friends with God. He called his, his apostles, you are my friends. His disciples, you are my friends. We're to be friends with the Lord in his will and his ways. But when we become engrossed in friends with the world and everything it has to offer, we're being unfaithful to the Lord. That's what he's saying. It's not what I'm saying. That's what he's saying. Adulterous, that's a strong word. Being unfaithful to the Lord. That's why I said this is one of the more powerful passages. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is in enmity with God? In other words, falling in love with the, the world, which is not even our home. is like being enemies with the Lord. I mean loving it to the point where it's your number one love rather than Christ. You, you got what I'm saying. Now don't hear me say that the Lord doesn't want you to enjoy his blessings and the pleasures of life. Not saying that at all. What I'm saying, and there's nothing wrong with money. What's wrong with money is what we do with the money. There's nothing wrong with temptation. Temptation's not a sin. It's what we do with the temptation that makes it a sin. Paul says in the New Testament, the Lord has given you blessings and gifts for you to enjoy. Eat and receive your gifts with thankfulness. God doesn't glory and people who live and walk around in rags with nothing to eat, he takes no delight in that. You know, some of you are thinking, well, you know, that's nice for you to say you just bought a new trailer. Well, guess what? Every bit, first of all, if you can afford to buy a new trailer, or even an old trailer, that means God has blessed you to be able to do that financially. True? And so, you may not believe this, 
But the Lord was very much a part, and I can tell you 10 circumstances that showed his hand was all over it. So I don't want you to feel bad or guilty about having nice things. It's what you do with the things that makes you a friend of the world. Okay? And then he actually says something even more powerful. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God, or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says, he, God, yearns jealousy over the Holy Spirit that he has given you. In other words, because he's given us the gift of the Holy Spirit, that means we belong solely to him, soul, body, and spirit. Do you realize your body belongs to Christ? It belongs to Christ. That's why he says, never join them sexually with someone that's not married to you. Because your body is holy and belongs to Christ. You're all good on that. Yeah. It's very clear, black and white. So he's saying, as our husband, we're the bride of Christ, as our husband, when we give our heart over to this world that's going to melt with fervent heat, as Peter says, under the judgment of God, he's jealous for us. <coughs> we belong to him. We're his bride. If your bride, sir, was showing interest in another man, you better say something about it. Vice versa. You better stop it. I've met women before who didn't feel their husbands loved them and in order to test them would start flirting with other men and the husband didn't say anything and she goes, yep, yeah, I knew he didn't love me and she ended up running off with a man because the husband didn't even try to stop it. God's jealous for us, for our loyalty, for our worship, for our love. That's what James is saying. He's saying, people that I wrote to, you're scattered, you're bitter, you're out there. You have gone way too far. It's time to come home to the Lord and give him the loyalty that he deserves and that you owe him. Then he gets, in verse 6, to a little bit brighter name. So verse 1 through 5 is like, I don't know what I could call it, you know, a, a, a blowtorch as big as this room from the Lord. And then, as he always does, ends up with grace. Even these people that he is raping over the coals, it's never too late. They can turn their heart over to the Lord in a whisper. That guy's. Look at verse 6. Um, but, but, with all of the things that they've done, and all of the idolatry, and all of the quarreling, and the fighting, and the carnality, and them shaking their fist at God, and abandoning his call on their life, James says, but God. But God, he gives more grace. He gives more grace, kindness, generosity, forgiveness, peace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So he's saying, you know, it's never too late. Never too late. You've wandered off from me, believers, James says to them. It is never too late to humble yourselves and the Lord will just lift you up. I mean, really, think about it. Which as ugly as our lives have gotten in the past, we are a breath and one word away from being totally restored 
by his grace. One word. Help. Lord, I need help. I've ruined my life because I didn't keep you in the center of my life. I've destroyed it. Help. Done. Changes your heart in a second. You with me? That's what he did to me. He gives more grace, therefore says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. I'm going to tell you, you know, Proverbs lists seven deadly sins. You know what number one is? Pride. That was the sin that took Lucifer down. As Steve alluded to. Pride. There is not a sin more forcefully offensive to God than pride. By the way, Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, many of us, we know that they were lustful and immoral and really bad. But God didn't judge them for that. He judged them for the sin of pride because they determined what was right and what was wrong as a community. And God judged them for that. So, man, never be too far from the Lord when you say, Lord, I am so, I blew it. Oh, I'm so sorry. You're back in. Well, he loves you. You can't be separated from him anyway because we believe in eternal security. But we can go through a lot of pain. Um, he gives grace to the hope. Now listen to verse 7. So this is part of, this part, part of humility. So, people that are walking with the Lord and, they, and they're broken and they're humble and they just, it's kind of like the, the Pharisee in, in the uh, I don't know who, maybe just the poor Jew Jesus tells a, a, a parable that a Jew was at the temple thanking God for all of the wonderful gifts that he gave him his knowledge and his who he was and, and then the little, the little humble peasant was on his knees he wouldn't even look up and he beat his chest and said, God, forgive me. I'm a sinner. That's what the Lord's looking for. So he says, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Submission. Bow the knee. Give up our rights. I was going to ask by asking this question, but I forgot. I remember it now. Are you set in your ways? Are you a person that is set in your ways? Well, you're a perfect project for the Lord. He will unset you so fast your head will spin. I get the feeling that he's talking to people who are so stubborn and so arrogant and so I made a life for myself. He's saying, you better get unset. You better stop thinking that you're drawing a hard line here. You're dealing with the creator of the universe and you're a gnat like a piece of lint on cloth. And say, Lord, I want your will. But not mine. Please. Help me. Submit to God. I find that when we resist the Lord in His will, it's very, very painful and it doesn't go away. But the moment we throw up the white flag and go whatever you want, all of a sudden, peace. It takes a while to get there. These people that He was writing to, they didn't have a white flag to throw up. They were resistant and they weren't budging. Stop. Stop. You know, for people, I think I've mentioned this before, for people that were drowning victims um, and, and were saved at the last second, 
So they survived the drowning experience. They took in water. They finally said, this is it. And they took in water and someone pulled them out of the water right away. Their testimony about that, what they say about that, is the hardest part of the drowning experience, experience and we would all do it, of course, is the fight to stay alive and get to air. That was the most terrifying, horrific, painful part of the drowning experience. The most peaceful part of the experience is when I gave up and took water in. It was so peaceful. Someone pulled them out of the water, saved the life. So when we resist the Lord and fight with what he's asking, it gets worse. But when we say, whatever you want, whatever you want, things seem to be peaceful again. That's what he's asking these people to do. Stop being so dang stubborn and know it all. Come back to Jesus. Uh, then he says, resist the devil he was, would flee from you. Resist the devil. And he would, now how do we do that? Anybody? How do you resist the devil so he'll flee from you? I say cling to God because he's not going to want to be around you if you want to be close to God. Yes, and I can cling to the Lord for sure in your heart and then another one, good old fashioned, plead the blood of Christ. Good old flash fashion advice, Romans 10. Romans 12, 10. Actually, let's turn there. I, I couldn't say it any better than what John said in Romans. Romans 12, 10. For those of you that actually feel harassed at some time, sometimes by the enemy of your soul. Well, well I know Paul, he says, uh, don't just, uh, like when it comes to temptation and everything, and then he, he, uh, he says, don't just, Resist it. Flee from it. Flee from it. Run. Flee from yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Where are you at though? This is, uh, uh, this is, excuse me, what I say Romans? I, I meant Revelation, Revelation 12. I'm sorry. Revelation 12. So we're, we're on resist the devil and he'll flee. Perfect verses here. Okay, this is John. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power of the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accusers of our brother, who's the accuser? Satan. Satan. He's called the accuser of the brothers. He's called a slanderer. Lucifer, the accuser of our brothers. That's his title. For the accusers of our brothers has been thrown down. We're talking about end times now. Who accuses God's people day and night before the Lord. He slithers before the Lord's throne day and night accusing us. Back and forth. Back and forth. And they, God's people, and they have conquered him, Satan, they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony because they love not their lives even until death. So, I think Satan, we see it in the New Testament, shudders when he hears the name of Jesus. He shudders. I just say, Jesus, if I ever, if I ever get chills and I'm sensing something's not right here, and there is an evil force somewhere around here. Plead the blood of Christ. Lord Jesus, take care of this. Yes? One of the difficult things for me to do, though, is to recognize the attack from Satan. To recognize that, no, this isn't this person, this isn't this situation, this isn't that. This is actual spiritual warfare, and this is an attack from Satan. Yeah. Well, Paul warns his, the believers, maybe in Corinthians, um, to not allow set, uh, Satan to deceive you 
and cause you to stray from your sincere faith. So deception sometimes means that everyone else can see it but you. I have some special D words that help me. Doubt, deception, uh, discouragement, depression, these yeah. D words when I start to good. feel those. And, oh, wait a minute. Well, what he does, he cannot possess us. We have the Holy Spirit who possesses us. You cannot be demon possessed as a believer, ever. Never insult the Lord by saying that's possible, ever. But he can harass us. Because Paul said, he also said, um, a messenger of Satan was sent to buffet me. That means punch me over and over and over again. And I plead... Because the, 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 a messenger of Satan was sent, this is 2 Corinthians chapter 12, a messenger of Satan was sent to harass me and punch me over and over and over spiritually. Because I was given a thorn in the flesh. So some people feel, feel that Paul had some eye problems. Maybe he was legally blind. Uh, he was bow-legged. He was in bad shape. He was beaten, almost beat to death three times. I mean, he was in bad shape. So Satan comes then and capitalizes on his weaknesses and he comes and capitalizes on our weaknesses and he knows what our most vulnerable access point is in terms of temptation. And he'll try to beat us to that death with that until we breathe our last. And so he accesses that, that he also accesses us through bitterness. Paul says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. So for those of us that have anger issues and we sleep on it day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, you're a bitter person. I promise. He says, don't let the sun go down on your anger or you give the devil a foothold in your life. So I suggest if you got any bitterness and anger, ask the Lord to take it from you tonight. Yeah. So resisting the devil is basically resisting the wrong way because if Jesus said he'll give us the desire of our hearts and that we don't get the desire of our hearts because we're lusting. What we're really lusting for is to fulfill something that God wants for us, but in the wrong way. In the wrong way, yeah, sure. So resisting the devil, I mean, stay committed. What did, Paul, what did uh, John say in Revelation? They, 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 they spoke of the blood of the Lamb. They continued to talk about their testimony of how they were saved. And they loved not their lives to death. And so you resist the devil by being anchored as a follower of Christ. We're not going anywhere but where he's going. Nowhere where he's not going. I remember Moses said to him, God said, I want you to go here and there. He goes, I'm not going unless you go with me. So to me, resisting the devil means there is no other way to go than to follow what Christ has taught us, what he has said, what he's calling us to do. That's automatically resisting the devil. Automatically. Okay, and then let's finish up here. You know, oh, uh, there's another place in Revelation that you can think about it in the same context. is Revelation 3, verse 1, I believe it is, about talking about a church, uh, wanting this church to wake up, saying it has a reputation for being awake, but in fact it's asleep. Yeah, yeah. Um, and in that context of just like, uh, a lot of churches and a lot of people like they they talk about being awake and everything but they're not like but they're asleep they're not active yep. and so I know the devil can come in and prey on those weaknesses oh yeah and keep them even more silent yeah. you know yeah so that's what he's that's a good very good verse James is trying to wake, wake these people up they're going in the wrong direction. And they didn't start off that way. 
Okay, and then and then a couple other verses. Uh, verse uh, well, then he says, "Draw near to God; He will draw near to hear you." And he's talking about forgiveness and cleansing. Now he says, "Cleanse your hands, you sinners; purify your hearts, you double-minded." Double-minded means vacillate, back for it, back for it. I want Christ; I don't want Christ. I need Christ; I don't need Christ. I want to follow Christ, but I want to do what I want to do. That's called double-mindedness. It's offensive to the heart of God. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Purify your hearts, you double-minded, wishy-washy, in and out, in and out. Are you sold out for Christ or aren't you? You either are or you're not. You're either in all the way or you're out all the way. Look at verse 9. Be wretched... I didn't take time to study that, but be wretched and mourn and weep. Like, be broken. Come to your senses and be broken over where your life has gone. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. It's okay to be convicted and to have sorrow. And by the way, if someone that you know is really convicted about something they've done, and I mean, and they're really going through it, and they're very saddened, and they feel very remorseful and broken, don't interfere with them. Don't try to cheer them up. If the Lord has convicted them about something and they're broken, and they're mourning their life for a time, let them do it. It's a sacred moment. God's cleansing their heart and bringing them back. Don't say, oh no, it's going to be okay. No. If he's convicted them and they're broken and they're crying, let them get out of their system. Lastly, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. I just want to close with this, by the way. So, is there ever a time, um, is there ever a time when it's appropriate for us to fight back as Christians? Yes, it is. There is. Old Testament, you see it everywhere. God had the mightiest army in the world, and they shed a lot of blood. There's a time to fight back. Here's some ideas. Personally speaking, there will be times when the Lord will call us literally to allow ourselves to be taken advantage of. There's going to come a time when we know someone's doing that and the Lord's going to say, let it go. Let it go. However, if your personal life or your family's being threatened, fight back and pull out all stuff. If you're personally being physically threatened or your family, no mercy. Second, can, how do we fight back in the civil realm, <clears throat> the political realm, which is probably our main realm right now? <clears throat> Submit to those in political authority. Romans 13 verse 1 says, Submit to those in governing authority. Period. Not if or but or when or should this happen. Period. However, if the political authority are asking you to go against your convictions and sin, no way. No submission there. Thirdly, what about the spiritual realm? Declare and live a righteous life before the Lord that others may see it, be persuaded by it, and just set your heels. The world can fall down around me. I'm going with God. I was talking to a woman the other day about some very sensitive matters of, regarding moral issues. And... Uh, you know, she felt that God has latitude for certain types of immorality. 
and she felt that God was loving and he wouldn't judge someone involved with immorality. And I said, well, Jesus caught a woman in adultery and he said, neither do I condemn you, but what? Go leave your life of sin. I'm going with God on that. I'm going with God on that, not our culture. Amen? Amen. Lord, thank you for your word tonight. Thank you for the feedback. And, and for all of us, Lord, for people that we think of, that we know of, for our own lives, Lord, we can get very, very sloppy spiritually. And we just thank you that your Holy Spirit loves us enough to call us on it, to check us, to convict us, to interrupt us, to interfere us, to discipline us. These are all loving things you do, Lord, because we're your bride. And you're going to hold us tight. And we love you for it. But if there's any area of our life, Lord, we would all say that is weak or needs strengthened, assistance, greater assistance from your powerful hand. We ask that you help us and grant us your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, friends. I went two minutes over. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Nice seeing you. <laughs> See you in a couple weeks. Three weeks to be exact. Oh, no, we're going into November, so it's going to be a little different. Yeah. I think I'm doing one Wednesday in November and then one Sunday in November, too. Sunday after Thanksgiving. Oh, I know. I got it memorized now, John. <laughs>